have a very large bone to pick with the Miami Marlins. The Marlins have gotten off to an extremely rough start to the year, especially when considering they made it to the playoffs last year. It's been incredibly unfortunate because they've had so many injuries to that young pitching rotation before opening day even. And due to this, naturally, you're going to have guys in the starting rotation that you didn't plan on having in the rotation this early in the year. This is kind of what happened with Max Mayer. Max Mayer is the number two rated prospect in the Marlins farm system, and the Marlins brought him up to replace the holes that were left in the rotation by Braxton Garrett, Yuri Perez, Sandy Alcantara. He got a couple starts in the bigs in 2022, but he went down with an injury himself. It was Tommy John, of course, which is basically expected nowadays. It was expected that Max Mayer would eventually make it to Miami this season and be a part of that starting rotation. It just happened to be a bit earlier than expected. He made his first start in April against the Angels, and it was all right. Nothing too crazy. He went five innings, four strikeouts, a couple earned runs given up, a couple walks. Not incredible, but certainly gave his team a chance to win. His next start was a bit better against the Cardinals. He would pitch six innings, striking out three, just giving up three hits and one walk to the Cardinals. A quality start, the first of his career, as well as his first career win. And his next start, which was this past Saturday, Max Mayer went against the Atlanta Braves, who have the best offense in baseball so far this season in terms of OPS, and Mayer absolutely shoved. He went six innings, giving up six hits. He didn't walk anyone, only allowed one run, and he struck out seven. All of these starts were really promising. The Marlins themselves are two and one in Mayer's starts this year. And do you know what Mayer earned from these three starts? Did you guess a trip back to AAA? Because if you did, you'd be absolutely correct. The Marlins are activating Edward Cabrera and sending Mayer to AAA as the corresponding move. I just don't get it. Edward Cabrera has had some very good success in the majors, is a very promising young pitcher, but it's no secret that he has control issues. You cannot tell me that sending Mayer down to AAA is beneficial for him or the team at this point of the year for the team or even Mayer's career. And I'm not saying you don't call back up Cabrera. I'm saying you send down someone else that's not Max Mayer. Keep them both. Please tell me your thoughts. Maybe I'm wrong and I'm just not seeing it. If this is not a service time thing, what more do you need to see? He's been the best pitcher on their team thus far, and in fact, he leads the whole team in war right now with 0.8. It is clear to me that the Marlins have packed it in. They have given up. And to think of it, they gave up long before this move. They gave up as soon as the offseason started when they wanted to demote Kim Ang, their GM who had done a fantastic job in getting this Marlins team back to the playoffs. I mean, if I was employed by the Marlins in any fashion, I would be terrified of performing too well because that clearly means an imminent demotion or your outright release. This was also the offseason where they could bring in a ton of bats to supplement the good young pitching that they had, and they did nothing. They brought in Tim Anderson. That's not a significant improvement. Maybe not an improvement at all. And yeah, he could bounce back, but that is definitely not something that a team who made it to the playoffs last year should rely on. They lost Jorge Soler, and there was no one else brought in to replace that production. Josh Josh Bell and Jake Berger were nice trade acquisitions at the deadline last year, and Josh Bell played very well for the team down the stretch. But Bell has been very up and down over his career, and I wouldn't feel good about him being your number three hitter on a team trying to get back to the playoffs. Same thing with Jake Berger. He had a fantastic year in 2023, but can he do it again? And I'm not sure we're even going to find out, because he in fact just went on the IL a couple days ago. People can say it would have been a wash anyway if they spent a lot at the deadline because of all the pitching injuries. But in November, no one knew that Yuri Perez was going to need Tommy John in March. No one knew that Braxton Garrett was going to have shoulder impingement in February. We all know that Sandy Alcantara was going to miss the entire year, but a rotation of Jesus Lazardo, Yuri Perez, Braxton Garrett, Edward Cabrera, and Max Mayer would be competitive enough to get back to the playoffs if they spent more resources on constructing a better lineup. It's just super frustrating, and I feel really bad for Marlins fans right now. But anyway, let's move on to something else before I have a medical emergency. Liking and subscribing would also help thwart an imminent medical emergency. I appreciate you all watching let me know your thoughts on the marlins right now do you agree with my takes or do you disagree and tell me why i would love to have a conversation about it all right moving on to something better to talk about the los angeles angels they had a very good late in and comeback against the rays last night to get their record back to 500 mike trout went yard giving him a league tying seven homers taylor ward went deep again that would be his sixth homer of the year and anthony rendon has been hitting lately don't let a slash line right now fool you over his last seven games he is hitting 433 with the 1004 OPS. Is Anthony Rendon back? And speaking of back, the A's had sent down his Stewie Rees after opening day weekend, kind of a similar situation to Max Mayer's situation. They brought him back up. He pinch hit late in the game and he went yard with his only at bat. The A's still ended up losing to the Cardinals. Sonny Gray had another great start coming back from his early injury. He hasn't allowed a run yet. Arenado is starting to swing the twig a little bit. Would like to see him hit for a bit more power, which is something the Orioles did against the Twins yesterday. Cedric Mullins and Ryan O'Hearn both hit homers in back-to-back -back games.
games. Gunnar Henderson also got into the homer action. This would be his fourth of the year. He's starting to hit for some power. Colton Kowser, however, who has been going off, had himself an off game getting the golden sombrero. Jackson Holiday is still struggling to find some consistency, but he's 20 years old. Once he gets his going, this lineup is going to be so good. Orioles will take this game seven to four. And in case anyone forgot, Michael Lorenzen pitches for the Rangers now. He went up against his former team last night, making his first start of his season, and he shut them out across five innings. He did walk five across those innings, but managed to escape allowing no runs and striking out four. Rangers would go on to win one nothing. And speaking of shutouts, the Guardians and Red Sox were working on shutouts of their own on Monday as Xavion Curry and Cutter Crawford dueled it out. Neither of them scoring until the Guardians started a scoring spree when they decided to put up two runs every inning until the game was over, starting in the seventh inning. They scored six runs on nine hits, nice, and shut out the Red Sox, getting the dub. Staying in the AL East, the Blue Jays took on the Red Hot Yankees in Toronto where Chris Bassett was having the usual Chris Bassett start. Six and a third inning, striking out five, walking two. Luis Heal would get the loss for the Yankees. He's having a great year, by the way, but it is difficult to win when you walk seven batters in five innings. He would still only give up three runs and strike out six, but the bats were nowhere to be found. Jays would win three to one. And across town from the Yankees, the New York Mets have been extremely hot and have won three series in a row. They were taking on the Pirates. Mets were down by 3-0 in the bottom of the sixth, but then they would score three themselves to tie the game. Harrison Bader with an RBI double against Chapman in the eighth that would give the Mets the lead, and they would end up winning by a score of 6-3. to three. The Colorado Rockies, who have been known for their incredible decision-making as a franchise, decided that it was a good idea to pinch run Kyle Freeland late in the game against Philadelphia. There's certainly no risks involved with this, right? Pitchers certainly haven't been getting injured at an alarming rate. In fact, maybe it would be safer for a starting pitcher to get into a bang-bang play at the plate, but we would all be mistaken as there's a collision at home plate. He reportedly dislocated his non-throwing shoulder, but will be fine and does not need to miss any time. But that was another move that is right on par with the Rockies game plan as a franchise, and they lose deservedly 2-1 to one to the Phillies in extras. The Cubs and the D-backs also went to extras. Michael Bush homered again to give him his sixth homer of the year. Nico Horner would hit an RBI single in the 11 to give the Cubs a one-run lead, and the D-backs couldn't answer and the Cubs would get the dub. And it seems like every time I look up at the box scores, the White Sox are putting up zero runs. They would get shut out again, this time by the Royals. Seth Lugo would get the win. Vinny Pasquantino with a home run in the fourth to give the Royals a lead, which is all they would need. White Sox got shut out for the second time in three days. But the Seattle Mariners are not getting shut out today. They erupted for nine runs against the Reds. Jorge Polanco hit his third homer of the year. He's hit homers in back-to-back -back games. Mitch Hanniger also going yard with a two-run shot. Frankie Montes only making it through two innings, giving up five runs. George Kirby got his second win of the year and put up a quality start. He struck out six over six innings, giving up two runs. It's very good to see the Mariners bats wake up a little bit. And the Nationals also decided to wake up their bats against Tyler Glass down the Dodgers when CJ Abrams hit his fourth bomb of the year to tie the game in the third inning. Joey Gallo would hit an RBI double to get the lead. Luis Garcia Jr. would then hit his first bomb of the year to put the Nats ahead six to two. Glass now gave up six runs in five innings of work and the Nats would win six to four. The Braves also erupted in Houston, but it wouldn't be until the ninth inning against Josh Hader. Braves put up a total of four runs up against Hader and he would have to get pulled after only getting one out. Braves take game one of the series six to one. That's their first time in Houston since winning the World Series against them in 2021. The Padres and Brewers face off where a couple of their young emerging superstars would have fantastic games. Jackson Merrill went three for five with two RBI and Jackson Churio hit his third bomb of the year. His OPS is climbing and he's starting to play like we all thought he would. But that was not enough for the Brewers as Joe Musgrove would get the Padres a quality start and get his second win of the year. Okay, I finally feel like I can talk about the Marlins again without having a medical emergency. Marlins lost to the Giants four to three, but Edward Cabrera threw six strong innings, striking out 10. He didn't walk anyone and that's a great sign for the Marlins. If some of their players can wake up at the plate or step up soon, maybe this season won't be lost, but right now, I don't think that will be the case. Thanks for watching. Peace.